Storytime Classics Audio presents Don Quixote and the Windmills Story by Miguel de Cervantes As told by Judge Perry Adapted and read by Taylor Seth Hall Once upon a time, there lived in a certain village in a province of Spain called La Mancha, a gentleman named Quijada, or Quesada, for indeed historians differ about this, whose house was full of old lances, halberds, and other such armors and weapons. He was, besides, the owner of an ancient shield, an old horse, and a swift greyhound. He was about fifty years old, a strong, hard-featured man with a withered face, he was an early riser, and had once been very fond of hunting. But now, for a great portion of the year, he applied himself wholly to reading old books of knighthood, and this with such keen delight that he forgot all about the pleasures of the chase and neglected all household matters. His mania and folly grew to such a pitch that he sold many acres of his lands to buy books of the exploits and adventures of the knights of old. These he took for true and correct histories, and when his friends came to see him, he would dispute with them as to which of the knights of romance had done the greatest deeds. So eagerly did he plunge into the reading of these books that he many times spent whole days and nights poring over them, and in the end, through little sleep and much reading, his brain became tired, and he fairly lost his wits. His fancy was filled with those things that he had read of enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, tempests, and other impossible follies, and those romantic tales so firmly took hold of him that he believed no history to be so certain and sincere as they were. Finally, his wit being extinguished, he was seized with one of the strangest whims that ever madman stumbled on in this world, for it seemed to him right and necessary that he himself should become a knight-errant, and ride through the world in arms to seek adventures and practice in person all that he had read about the knights of old. Therefore he resolved that he would make a name for himself by revenging the injuries of others and courting all manner of dangers and difficulties, until in the end he should be rewarded for his valour in arms by the crown of some mighty empire. And, first of all, he caused certain old rusty arms that belonged to his great-grandfather, and had laid for many years neglected and forgotten in a by-corner of his house, to be brought out and well scoured. He trimmed them and dressed them as well as he could, and then he saw that they had something wanting, for instead of a proper helmet they had only a morion or headpiece, like a steel bonnet without any visor. This his industry supplied, for he made a visor for his helmet by patching and pasting certain papers together, and this pasteboard fitted to the morion gave it all the appearance of a real helmet. Then, to make sure that it was strong enough, he out with his sword and gave it a blow or two, and with the very first did quite undo that which had cost him a week to make. He did not at all approve the ease with which it was destroyed, and to make things better, he placed certain iron bars within it, in such a manner that it made him feel sure it was now sound and strong, without putting it to a second trial. He next visited his horse, who had nothing on him but skin and bone, yet he seemed to him a better steed than the noble animal that carried Alexander the Great when he went to battle. He spent four days inventing a name for his horse, saying to himself that it was not fit that so famous a knight's horse and so good a beast should want a known name. Therefore he tried to find a name that should both give people some notion of what he had been before he was a steed of a knight-errant, and also what he now was. For, seeing that his lord and master was going to change his calling, it was only right that his horse should have a new name, famous and worthy of his new position in life. 
and, after having chosen, made up, put aside, and thrown over any number of names as not coming up to his idea, he finally hit upon Rosinante, a name in his opinion sublime, expressing in a word what he had been when he was a simple carriage-horse, and what was expected of him in his new dignity. The name being thus given to his horse, he made up his mind to give himself a name also, and in that thought laboured for another eight days. Finally he determined to call himself Don Quixote, and remembering that the great knights of olden time were not satisfied with a mere dry name, but added to it the name of their kingdom or country, so he, like a good knight, added to his own that also of his province, and called himself Don Quixote de la Mancha, whereby he declared his birthplace and did honour to his country by taking it for his surname. His armour being scoured, his morion transformed into a helmet, his horse named, and himself furnished with a new name, he considered that now he wanted nothing but a lady on whom he might bestow his service and affection. For, he said to himself, remembering what he had read in the books of knightly adventures, if I should by good hap encounter with some giant, as knights errant ordinarily do, and if I should overthrow him with one blow to the ground, or cut him with a stroke in two halves, or finally overcome and make him yield to me, it would be only right and proper that I should have some lady to whom I might present him. Then would he, entering my sweet lady's presence, say unto her with a humble and submissive voice, Madam, I am the great giant lord of an island, whom the never-too-much-praised knight Don Quixote de la Mancha hath overcome in single combat. He hath commanded me to present myself to your greatness, that it may please your highness to dispose of me according to your liking. You may believe that the heart of the knight danced for joy when he made that grand speech, and he was even more pleased when he had found out one whom he might call his lady. For they say there lived in the next village to his own a hale, buxom country wench with whom he was sometime in love, though for the matter of that she had never known of it or taken any notice of him whatever. She was called Aldanza Lorenzo and her he thought fittest to honour as the lady of his fancy. Then he began to search about in his mind for a name that should not vary too much from her own, but should at the same time show people that she was a princess or lady of quality. Thus it was that he called her Dulcinea of Toboso, a name sufficiently strange, romantic, and musical for the lady of so brave a knight. And now, having taken to himself both armor, horse, and lady fair, he was ready to go forth and seek adventures. We interrupt this story to let you know that the easiest way to support this podcast is to purchase our recording of The Reluctant Dragon. The link is in the description. And now, back to the story. Don Quixote determined to find for himself a squire. For this office he fixed in his own mind upon a ploughman, a neighbour of his, a poor man who had many children, but yet a man who was very fit as he thought to be his squire. The neighbour was an honest man, but one of very shallow wit. In the end Don Quixote gave him so many fair words and promises that the poor fellow determined to go with him. Among other things, he told him that he ought to be very pleased to depart with him, for at some time or other an adventure might befall, which should, in the twinkling of an eye, win him an island, and leave him governor thereof. On the faith of these and other like promises, Sancho Panza, for so he was called, forsook his wife and children, and took service as squire to his neighbour. He told Sancho Panza the day and hour on which he meant to start, he also charged him to provide himself with a wallet, which Sancho promised to do, and said that he also meant to take a very good donkey named Dapple along with him, which he had of his own, because he was not used to travel so much afoot. In the matter of the donkey, 
The knight-errant hesitated a little, calling to mind whether he had ever read that any knight-errant was ever attended by a squire mounted on donkey-back, but no such case occurred to his memory. Nevertheless, he decided that the donkey should be taken, with the intention of providing his squire with a more dignified mount, when he had a chance, by unhorsing the first discourteous knight he met with. All this being arranged, Sancho Panza and Don Quixote sallied forth from the village one night, unknown to any person living. They travelled so far that night that at daybreak they were safe against discovery, even if they were pursued. And Sancho Panza rode along on his beast like a patriarch with his wallet and bottle, full of a huge desire to see himself governor of the island which his master had promised him. Whilst they were journeying along, Sancho Panza said to his master, I pray you have good care, Sir Knight, that you forget not that government of the island which you promised me, for I shall be able to govern it, be it ever so great. And Don Quixote replied, Thou must understand, friend Sancho, that it was a custom very much used by ancient knights errant to make their squires governors of the islands and kingdoms they conquered, and I am resolved that so good a custom shall be kept up by me. And if thou livest and I live, it may be well that I might conquer a kingdom within six days and crown thee king of it. By the same token, said Sancho Panza, if I were a king, then should Joan, my wife, become a queen, and my children princes and princesses? Who doubts of that? said Don Quixote. That do I, replied Sancho Panza, for I am fully persuaded that though it rained kingdoms down upon the earth, none of them would sit well upon my wife. She is not worth a farthing for a queen. She might scrape through as a countess, but I have my doubts of that. As they were talking, they caught sight of some thirty or forty windmills on a plain. As soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Fortune is guiding our affairs better than we could desire, for behold, friend Sancho, how there appear thirty or forty monstrous giants with whom I mean to do battle and take all their lives. With their spoils we will begin to be rich, for this is fair war, and it is doing great service to clear away these evil fellows from off the face of the earth. What giants? said Sancho, amazed. Thou seest there replied his master, with the long arms. Take care, sir, cried Sancho, for those we see yonder are not giants but windmills, and those things which seem to be arms are their sails, which, being whirled round by the wind, make the mill go. It is clear, answered Don Quixote, that thou art not yet expected experienced in the matter of adventures. They are giants, and if thou art afraid, get thee away home whilst I enter into cruel and unequal battle with them. So saying, he clapped spurs to Rosinante, without heeding the cries by which Sancho Panza warned him that he was going to encounter not giants but windmills for he would neither listen to Sancho's outcries nor mark what he said, but shouted to the windmills in a loud voice, Fly not, cowards and vile creatures, for it is only one night that assaults you. A slight breeze having sprung up at this moment, the great sail arms began to move, on seeing which Don Quixote shouted out again, Although you should wield more arms than had the giant Briarius, I shall make you pay for your insolence. Saying this, and commending himself most devoutly to his lady Dulcinea, whom he desired to aid him in this peril, covering himself with his buckler, and setting his lance at rest, he charged at Rosinante's best gallop, and attacked the first mill before him. Thrusting his lance through the sail, the wind turned it with such violence that it broke his weapon into shivers, carrying him and his horse after it, and having whirled them round, finally tumbled the knight a good way off, and rolled him over the plain, sorely damaged. Sancho Panza hastened to help him as fast as his donkey could go, and when he came up he found the knight unable to stir. Such a shock had Rosinante given him in the fall. "'Bless me!' 
said Sancho. Did I not tell you that you should look well what you did? For they were none other than windmills, nor could any think otherwise unless he had windmills in his brains. Peace, friend Sancho, said Don Quixote, for the things of war are constantly changing, and I think this must be the work of some magician, and he hath changed these giants into windmills to take from me the glory of victory. But in the end his evil arts shall avail but little against the goodness of my sword. May it prove so, said Sancho, as he helped his master to rise and remount Rosinante, who, poor steed, was himself much bruised by the fall. Sancho Panza leaped upon his donkey to follow him, and Don Quixote, without another word, rode away at a swift pace and turned into a wood that was hard by, leaving Sancho to follow him as fast as his beast could trot. Thank you for listening to this episode of Storytime Classics Audio. Storytime Classics Audio is dedicated to sharing family-friendly stories in a way that is both entertaining and educational. The podcast commits to share short stories for free, but we can't do it alone. The easiest way to support Storytime Classics Audio is to purchase our production of The Reluctant Dragon, available for only $3.50 on Spotify, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, and Google Play. A link is in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to hit that follow button and then share these stories with your friends. Next week on Storytime Classics Audio... The Story of the Velveteen Rabbit. <laughs>